University Avenue. I was working at m &L Motor Supply on University Avenue across from Ward's making $108 a week as an order filler guy while attending college part-time. It was 1969. My job was to take phoned-in orders, push a cart through the warehouse, locate the parts that were in stock, box them for shipment, and back order the rest. This particular day, I was standing on a step stool, poking at the box end of a Mopar combo tailpipe and muffler set for a 64 Plymouth Fury, when the pipe began sliding down toward me. The box was eight feet long, contained 46 pounds of hardened steel. It was falling now, falling from the stacks, sailing down to me like a bride, and it struck me on the left side of my forehead. The blow alone would have knocked me out. A baseball bat could not have hit harder, but first it sent the ladder teetering back, back, until I fell backward and crashed to the floor. When I came to, I was changed. I struggled to stand. My fingers tingled. I felt an egg, a protruding bud from my brow. I looked in the mirror, in the dirty warehouse toilet, and washed away the blood. And I remembered. I had a final exam at one o'clock in my class on prosody in the humanities building at the university. I had completely forgot. The Borg Warner clock over the carburetor kits said 125. Snow was falling and wind was blowing. I staggered out to the street in a t-shirt, tie-dyed, but I did not feel cold. A 16A bus was just approaching from Hamlin Avenue, and I boarded wild-eyed. Where's your money? the driver asked. Eighty-five cents. I looked at him like long John Silver under the egg and said, you have to get me to the university, and took a seat halfway to the back. The passengers were coming home from morning shift. One man wore a hat that said, go for gears, and the same word on his jacket and thermos. The phrase has stuck with me over the years. I sat quiet, but in my mind, I was standing and telling them, do not be afraid, my brothers and sisters. I will make the journey from St. Paul to Minneapolis and do business there with TAs and professors. I will be valorous in my actions and acquit myself in a way you will be proud of. The assembly and forklift people will not be ashamed of this day, of one of their own climbing the heights of classical poetry. I stepped off the bus at the University Quad, made my way to Ford Hall Room 108, burst through the door, and every eye looked up at the egghead from the midway in the torn t-shirt. I grabbed a blue book from the stack and read the question. Analyze Houseman's 8 o'clock and explain how poetic form helps further the poet's message. Ordinarily, I might have struggled in vain with this assignment, but I had been struck by a muffler from the gods and I had insights I had never had before. When the pipe hit me full, it poured into me a galaxy of lights. I knew this poem by heart somehow. I had knelt on its floor and drunk its dark waters. I scanned the poem in 15 seconds and began to write in the book in big black letters. Each sprinkle of the clock tower bell brings the condemned man closer to his time. Each stanza of the poem is his knell, each line a stair to trembling climb. I stood and threw the blue book on the desk. The astonished 
professor shrank as I left the hall, and the graduate students on scholarship whispered about the mysterious boy from St. Paul. I would get an A, of course, but that was not the point. I was transformed, beyond dreams. I stood on the walkover bridge and gazed out over the brilliant white cloud of toilet paper plant steam. Gods and goddesses choose us mortals, not by our bloodlines or superior mothering, but because a magnet pulls metal down from the sky that tempers and makes us fit vessels for suffering. University Avenue begins at the Capitol and peters out only God knows where in Blaine. But I am with you to the fullness of all time and in my bones and skull I map your pain.